Hey folks, time for another Q&A on Earth's disaster cycle. We have four items to get through today in terms of questions and then gonna do a little commentary as we've been adding on to some of these videos recently. First question, when they spray the sky, is this going to help with the solar micronova? And the answer unfortunately is no. Um, I think that a lot of the things they are doing, and I'm, we're not going to get into chemtrailing very deeply today, uh, we've had several discussions on that in the past, had a speaker at one of our previous conferences about it. Um, a lot of what they're doing is not for our benefit. One side effect that we do benefit from is the fact that it should help to block uh, cosmic rays a little bit. It's not really going to help with the solar micronova situation at all. It's not going to help with the induced current. Uh, certainly not going to help with the impactors from the micronova shell or anything like that. Um, in general, again, without getting too deep into detail, I do not think they should be playing God in the sky. Uh, not a fan of geoengineering at all. Uh, question, will Mars become habitable? This is a fantastic question, and the answer is maybe. Um, Mars is certainly waking up. Um, hard to imagine that all of these new articles about its mantle being active, its mantle being alive, the super plume they discovered beneath an uh, Elysium uh, planetum or however you say that part of of, of Mars um, has been there for any considerable period of time. Um, Mars might be waking up. Now what that looks like I don't know. Is its atmosphere if it wakes up going to look like Earth's? Kind of doubt it. Maybe we'll have similarities but um, you know we could see planets go in and out of different cycles throughout these uh, different cycles of the solar system and the galaxy. And so, you know, I don't know how many of us are going to be around 100 years, 200 years from now, probably not so many of us 200 years from now, um, unless you uh, become a machine, an AI version of yourself. But it would be interesting to see exactly what happens to all the planets in the aftermath of this. Uh, there's really no way to know at this stage. A uh, question that we've actually been getting for a decade and it keeps coming up, so happy to bring it up again. Is the coming grand solar minimum, the ongoing weakening of the sun's magnetic field related to the Earth's? And the answer is just no. Um, when Earth's magnetic field started weakening, the sun was weak. Then the sun hit its grand solar maximum, not only of the last 400 years, but of pretty much the entire Holocene. Didn't do anything, the Earth kept going like this. And now that we are seeing the sun back on a decline, Earth is still going like this. There has been absolutely zero correlation that we can determine whatsoever between the sun's uh, magnetic field power and the Earth's magnetic field power here. Um, kind of like Mars may actually be increasing and increasing this whole time. But no, uh, the sun goes up and down over the 11 year cycle. It has an 88 year cycle, the 400 year grand cycle. And none of that has shown any correlation whatsoever with Earth's weakening magnetic field. The only thing we can possibly say is I'm hoping that we get a grand solar minimum uh, next sunspot cycle. Obviously isn't happening this sunspot cycle. Um, but I would trade the slightly worse weather that we're going to have uh, if we do get a grand solar minimum next sunspot cycle uh, in return for reducing the chances of the sun taking out global power with a major CME. And so uh, that's pretty much what we have to say on the grand solar minimum at this point. Um, we get this question sometimes as well, and it's born of a slight misunderstanding. What is the effect of the current sheet hitting the earth. And while it's not expressly stated in the question all the time, it sort of seems to me like this is coming from the idea that the current sheet hasn't hit us yet. Current sheet is exceptionally thick. It is a 200 to 300 year event. Uh, I believe it hit our solar system back in the 1800s, possibly 1859. That was the same year the magnetic poles started shifting, the same year the sun had its Carrington event, uh, its last super flare. And so um, the effects that we are seeing on the Earth, on the Sun, and all the planets throughout the interplanetary space, these are the effects of the galactic current sheet. And here that's primarily the changing magnetic field of our planet, um, which is then leading to the changes in the ionosphere, the atmosphere, the rotation speed of Earth, etc. Now, 
I've been doing a lot of talking recently about not going negative. Might get a tiny bit negative here because I see a lot of observers, people I care about, operating under bad information in the comment section, on Facebook, on Twitter. Again, this has nothing to do with me. This is talking about what's happened the last 24 hours on Twitter with Elon Musk. So here are the facts. This was one of the most co uh, coordinated, organized, and dishonest things I've ever seen the liberal media do. And I just watched them pull COVID. I watched them throughout this these last two election cycles here. This is about as, as rough as I've seen it get. So this person right here, they stalked Elon Musk's car, wearing a mask, was filming it, pulled out in front, blocked them in the middle of the road, and then jumped up on the hood of the vehicle. Thing is, Elon wasn't in the car. There was the driver and Elon's little son in the car. This person was only able to do this because of real-time doxing. People being told where someone is at an exact time so that other individuals who might have nefarious intentions can go find them and maybe do something to them. That is against the law. And after this happened to his son, Elon finally made it against official Twitter policy. Within 90 minutes, major liberal journalists, and when I say major, we're talking about Wall Street Journal, we're talking about uh, CNN, MSNBC, all posted the same verbatim stuff. Like they all got together and were like, post these exact words. It was amazing. Obviously coordinated and organized. Instantly started real-time doxing Elon Musk and posting where his jet was, where he was, other things like that. And so naturally, uh, since it's against the law and it was officially just made Twitter policy, they all got blocked on Twitter. So what did they start doing? They started crying about censorship. You can find tons of articles online. You can find tons of people on Twitter and other social media platforms saying, oh, Elon went back on his word. He doesn't like free speech. He doesn't, he doesn't this, he doesn't that. Well, first of all, free speech has limits. It does not include things when the rights and safety of other individuals is infringed upon. That's why slander, libel, and incitement are not versions of free speech. And I'm a pretty big freedom and free speech guy. No, I don't think slander should be legal. I don't think you should be able to incite violence and enable violence. And so there's the legal aspect to this. There's the uh, idea that um, these same journalists were saying, all in the past, hey, Twitter's a private company. They should be allowed to do what they want. They don't think that now, apparently. They are crying about censorship and writing these articles under false pretenses, using lies. And at no point in these articles do they mention that they were breaking the law and Twitter's rules in a coordinated effort. And they did this unequivocally so that they would get blocked so that they could tell these lies under false pretenses. My last comment on that is, uh, after the censorship cancel happy last couple of years we've had, watching these crybabies cry about censorship now is absolutely hilarious. And let's not forget, they got blocked for breaking the law and breaking official policies. People like us got blocked for telling the truth. Anyway, see you guys in the morning for The Daily Show. Be safe, everyone.